Welcome to the Wilson Combat Channel. My name is Masad Ayub, and today's topic is going to be a little bit different. At the Gun Rights Policy Conference this year, my topic was soundbite answers to BS gun control arguments. And the folks at Wilson Combat felt that might be worth reprising here. When I say soundbite, we live in a time of short attention spans. You know, TLDR, too long, didn't read. Anything over 280 characters, nobody's going to listen to. There's some truth to that in any polarized debate, and gun owner civil rights is certainly that. There is kind of a 10-80-10 rule. That means that on one side of the debate, there are 10 people who are locked into their position and are probably never going to change. And on the opposite pole of the debate, another 10% who are 180 degrees off from this 10%, and they're not going to change either. Our target audience is the 80% in the middle, the people who may or may not be leaning one way or another on the issue, but still have open minds and are willing to discuss it and are willing to change their positions given facts that support the change. The soundbite needs to be short. It needs to be crisp. Above all, it needs to be truthful and verifiable, because if you ever exaggerate once, you've lost the argument, you've lost the listener, you've lost the debate. If you can throw a little bit of humor in there, things that make people smile never hurt either. Examples, probably the shortest soundbite answer I've ever been able to use effectively was three words. You all recall in second quarter of 2022, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine was on and we all saw in the national news, the Ukrainian government was issuing genuine assault rifles, fully automatic AK-47s and AK-74s, to ordinary citizens to defend their homes, their businesses, and their homelands. And we're desperately trying to take those citizens from here's a, here's a primer, here's a bullet, to being able to defend against an invading army. During that same time period, we saw the atrocity that occurred at the elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. The anti-gun people, of course, went nuts. I was contacted by the British Broadcasting Company, BBC, in my capacity as president of the Second Amendment Foundation. And as you might imagine, uh, the, the British uh, broadcasters were not too thrilled with American gun owners, and it became a little bit hostile. And one of the first questions I got was kind of a snooty, well, how can the Second Amendment possibly be relevant in the year 2022? Recent events allowed me to give that three-word soundbite answer, ask a Ukrainian. You know, the whole Second Amendment thing still, after the Supreme Court has made it abundantly clear that it's an individual right, we still, after 2008, the Supreme Court's decision in Heller versus District of Columbia. After 2010, the Supreme Court's decision that reaffirmed that principle in McDonald versus City of Chicago. And even touched on it in 2022 in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. The Supreme Court, the arbiter of constitutional law, has made it clear the Second Amendment is an individual right. We still still get the constant, but Second Amendment is about the National Guard. Okay, I'll offer you two soundbite answers. One of them, if you really think it's about the National Guard, actually read the Bill of Rights. Take that controversial Second Amendment out. Read all the rest of them. It becomes abundantly clear this entire document speaks to the individual rights of individual citizens. Are we to assume that this document, one of the most carefully crafted documents in the history of statecraft, in the history of the human experience, utterly devoted to individual rights, suddenly, sloppily, someone decided, oh, we need a states' rights issue too, let's throw that in and we'll make it number two. I don't think anyone with a three-digit IQ can buy that. If you want another soundbite argument about the Second Amendment, my answer is this. In 1791, when that was crafted, the people who created the Bill of Rights were there for the American Revolution. The gunfire of the Revolution was still ringing in their ears when they wrote the Bill of Rights. A National Guard 
in that period of time would have been Tories loyal to King George, duty bound to crush the rebellion by killing their fellow colonists. Can anyone seriously believe that is what those great men sought to empower? One thing we're seeing a lot of now because our side has spoken so much of the truth of the good guy with a gun being the best way to stop the bad guy with a gun. Their latest meme is, well, they're good guys with guns until they aren't. And the obvious implication is that all of us are kindly Dr. Jekyll, who at any moment might turn into evil Mr. Hyde. And presumably, if we take the guns away, that wouldn't happen. So, gee, the gun must be the formula that turns Jekyll into Hyde. Well, if you get something that stupid, remember the soundbite makes people think. Anyone who asked me that, I'd say, Mr. and Ms. Prohibitionist, are you capable of overnight turning into a murderer, committing malicious murder? And most of the time, they say, no, I wouldn't. And there's your opening. And that's where you speak to those 80% in the middle and say to that prohibitionist, then how dare you imply everyone listening to you is an incipient potential murderer? The people on my side of this debate have a little more trust in their fellow Americans and their fellow citizens. And if you get one, unlikely, but you might, who says, yes, I could turn into a murderer, I would look at them in horror, push back a little bit and say, uh, the rest of us aren't like that. We normal people aren't like that. And if you seriously think tomorrow you could start murdering people, you need to be seeing a psychiatrist instead of pretending to give wise counsel to normal people who don't think like that. When they go, uh, go argumentum ad hominem, the argument against the individual instead of the argument against the point, uh, that's always the last resort if the person is losing an argument. See how often you've heard this. They buy those guns to compensate for sexual inadequacy. My answer is simple. If guns were phallic symbols, none of us ever would have bought one with a two-inch barrel. We keep hearing, how can you support guns when there are 38 to 40,000 deaths by gun violence in America? First, let's parse that out. The deaths by gun violence, the average person hearing that picture is 38 to 40,000 murders. You must understand that figure includes criminals killed by police in the line of duty. It includes criminals killed in self-defense by their intended victims who fought back and prevailed. Which means every one of those, yes, it's a death. Yes, it's a death by a gun. Every one of those represents an innocent life saved. We also have to realize that that figure, that 38 to 40,000 dead by the gun, includes a minimum 60% and some years as many as two thirds that were suicides. Now any suicide is sad and the emotionally driven suicide is absolutely tragic. The prohibitionists generally do nothing about it except say, let's take the guns away. On our side, we're doing a little more. I'm proud to be a member of the New Hampshire Firearm Safety Coalition which has worked hand in hand with suicide prevention groups and with their educational programs have saved countless lives. But let's consider also that suicide does not belong in the same mix as criminal homicide. X number of those suicides are what, what some psychologists have called the rational suicide. The individual who is dying a horrible death from a terminal disease that is wasting them and there is nothing but pain and agony until they draw their final breath. In essence, the rational suicide is self-euthanasia. We have at least 10 states in the United States where medically assisted suicide is absolutely legal. And those situations I respectfully submit should be taken out of the mix when the other side has to pad their arguments, and we can show they've padded their arguments, we have taken a big bite out of their credibility. When we look at the 38 to 40,000 uh, deaths by gun in a given year, we have to look at the fact that 
in the big picture. The, the 2021 study by political economist Bill William English indicated 1.67 million defensive gun usages in a given year in the United States. The DGU, the defensive gun usage, well, how come there's only 38,000 deaths? The vast majority of defensive gun usages, according to every single study going back into the 1970s, the vast majority end without any bloodshed on either side. The attacker realizes, my victim now has a gun in his or her hand. I could die from this. I'm leaving now. And in the words of the courts, they abjure from the conflict. But the other side doesn't count those. The other side, supposedly humanitarian, only sees victory where the citizen kills the bad guy. And that needs to be taken into account. 167 defensive gun usages could be as many as 1.67 million lives saved from the bite of the venomous snake that was shot by the gun, the attack of the vicious animal, or the attack of the violent predator that was warded off by that gun. Finally, we get, won't you at least give us something? Won't you at least concede to gun registration? After all, you register your automobiles. Yeah, we do, because with rare exceptions from extremists, nobody wants to confiscate our automobiles. People want to confiscate our guns. Remember Beto O'Rourke? We are coming for your AR-15s. Well, in the midterm elections of 2022, when Beto O'Rourke won his third defeat in, in a row politically, I wanted to celebrate. I thought I'd go to the bar and say, bartender, I'll have a Beto O'Rourke. How do you make that? Uh, give me a shot of Irish whiskey, but tell me it's tequila. And a whole lot of the anti-gun movements are like that. They tell you one thing, but they tell you this thing is something that it isn't. If we can show the other side that we are on the right side of the argument, that logic is on our side, that you will not stop criminal use of deadly weapons by depriving the law-abiding citizens from the weapons they would otherwise use to defend themselves against those criminals. To confiscate property legally owned and, res and responsibly owned by law-abiding citizens does nothing whatsoever to, to stop violent criminal behavior. And finally, why don't we want to bother registering our guns? Because in every draconian uh, tyranny, registered guns were confiscated by the tyrants to render their citizens helpless. And that's a matter of history, not QAnon conspiracy. But finally, the only people who wouldn't have to register their guns would be the criminals. Look up Haynes versus United States from the United States Supreme Court. You can't require a convicted felon to register his guns because it would violate his right against self-incrimination. Short answers, sharp answers, irrefutable truth that the person listening can verify for themselves. That's the cornerstone of the soundbite answer. They've been successful for me. I offer them for you. That was originally presented at the Gun Rights Policy Conference in Dallas. The Gun Rights Policy Conference is held every year, sponsored by the Second Amendment Foundation. You can access it online, and uh, the 2022 one is archived online. Go to saf.org, and you'll be able to find it. It's a treasure trove of information for anyone interested in this polarized debate and anyone who wants the side of the angels to win. Thank you for listening. Good luck with your own debates.